When people talk about screenwriters, someone who seems to get a lot of hate is Akiva Goldsman. Cinephiles look at his name with derision, and he's often called a hack. However, as I often say, filmmakers are not hacks. They're people. While his filmography does have some duds here and there, we should not assume them necessarily his fault, and he's had his name attached to quality projects. Some of his early screenwriting credits were in movies directed by Joel Schumacher. His first involvement in writing a blockbuster came when Schumacher asked him to perform a rewrite on Batman Forever. The initial drafts by Lee Batchelor and Janet Scott Batchelor established the Riddler and two faces of the villains, as well as Bruce Wayne having a psychiatrist love interest named Dr. Chase Meridian and the origin of Robin. According to Janet Scott Batchelor, most of what they wrote were retained in the finished film, with some things tweaked and some scenes added, as is often the norm with blockbuster movies like this. All three screenwriters also had to stick within the confines of what Warner Brothers wanted, which was a lighter, more crowd-pleasing movie than Batman Returns, in addition to incorporating Joel Schumacher's ideas. That's something people often forget about writers who work on franchise films. They are seen as cogs in the machine and need to answer the notes from studio executives, directors, and producers. That's not even getting into the ways in which actors can alter scripts and dialogue, and what happens in the editing room that can drastically change the structure of the screenplay. Case in point, the next movie in the series, Batman and Robin. It's well known that after Batman Forever became a huge success, WB wanted the sequel to be even lighter and even more toyetic. Akiva Goldsman, who wound up with sole screenwriting credit, was given more notes and requirements, including fitting in spots where new toys could be featured. The studio had also penciled in a release date that gave Goldsman little time to improve the script. Joel Schumacher took the blame for the movie's critical and audience reaction after its release, but I don't think he nor Goldsman deserve to be raked over the calls for Batman and Robin. Most filmmakers would have had a difficult time doing quality work with the strains put under them on that film. He did eventually work with other directors besides Schumacher. One of them was Ron Howard, with A Beautiful Mind being the most acclaimed collaboration. Akiva Goldsman even won the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay. The Academy Awards are not perfect, but I think winning an Oscar for screenwriting is an indication that maybe someone is not the worst writer ever. With a film needing to depict mathematician John Nash's life story and convey his complex equations to the audience in a way that's easily understandable, this could not have been an easy screenplay to write. The movie also plays with reality, as Nash is depicted as imagining people who don't exist. Like many biopics, there are fabrications in a beautiful mind, intended primarily for narrative purposes. However, I don't think these distract too much from the story it's trying to tell. Nash and his wife Alicia's romance became more prominent in later drafts, on the insistence of Howard, and this was lovingly portrayed too, although again with aspects changed from reality. They worked together on another biopic with Russell Crowe, Cinderella Man. Focused on James Braddock's boxing career during the Great Depression, I thought the film did its job of being an inspiring story, with the writing successfully developing the characters, and how Braddock and his wife cope with the hardships thrown their way. Howard also gave Goldsman the task of adapting Dan Brown's bestseller, The Da Vinci Code. I remember liking the movie when I saw it back in 2006, finding it the fun paperback mystery it was intended to be, and got caught up in the religious twists. However, upon revisiting the film many years later, I came to see just how silly the entire premise is. Through its almost two and a half hours, the Da Vinci Code plods along as we're treated to ridiculous conspiracy theories about the possible descendant of Jesus Christ. I feel like a lot of writers would struggle with this concept and trying to relate all this information to the audience. Akiva Goldsman has had a hand in writing blockbusters I'm enjoyed, most notably I, Robot and I'm Legend. While I understand Richard Matheson fans are annoyed with the latter of how it changed the source material, I was impressed with how it depicted the solitary nature of the main character. I'm Legend is surprisingly quiet and somber for Big Budget Studio Temple, and I admire that about it. There have been other major films he was involved in that I've been less impressed by. Lost in Space and The Dark Tower come to mind, both of which I found to be quite dire. However, with Lost in Space, I don't know what studio notes he was given, and it's possible that director Stephen Hopkins or several other producers were to blame for the film's quality. And The Dark Tower was one of those productions that spent several years in development hell, with many writers involved. Ron Howard was even going to direct at one point. Goldman later said that he was disappointed in the finished movie and regretted a lot of what made it to the screen, saying earlier drafts were much, much better. The truth is, so many writers are brought into these movies during pre-production, filming, and even through post-production, and because of the Writers Guild credit system, their names don't appear in the finished film. Even Akiva Goldsman has done uncredited work on movies as varied as Master and Commander of the Far Side of the World, Charlie's Angels, The Rundown, and Memoirs of a Geisha. Surprisingly, his last film writing credits were in 2017, partly because he's been a lot more heavily involved in television the past few years. He co-developed the DC comic series Titans, a darker take on the Teen Titans. I actually quite like the show and its version of the young superheroes. 
It offered Goldsman another chance at writing Robin, this time without having to worry about the toys, and the result is one of the best screen depictions of the boy wonder, in my opinion. We see how this Dick Grayson deals with the lasting trauma of the pressures put on him by Bruce Wayne, and how he attempts to get out of Batman's shadow. Goldsman has also been a key player in the current crop of Star Trek shows, although I have not seen any of them. He's the creator and showrunner of the recently premiered series Star Trek Strange New Worlds, and it appears to be getting very positive reviews from critics. And he has a show titled The Crowded Room coming soon to Apple TV+, and this is reportedly the most personal project he's ever worked on. So as you can see, I don't think Akiva Goldsman is close to being the worst screenwriter in the film industry, as his name has appeared on a number of worthwhile films, and it's entirely possible that the misses on his resume are the result of other factors that can hinder any writer. People often ask why Hollywood keeps hiring him, but they do more than just check someone's IMDb page. Directors and producers are probably aware of what his work looks like before others provide their notes and suggestions, and it's likely he's really good at pitching in the room. Brian Grazer, the producer of A Beautiful Mind, said he hired Goldsman to write the script specifically based on the ideas he presented in their initial meeting. My philosophy when I talk about screenwriters is this. If the movie works, then I compliment the writers. If it's not good, then I don't blame the writers. They have to deal with so much as they try to put the ideas to paper and see how it gets shaped during production and in the final cut. And before you think about name-calling a screenwriter like Mr. Goldsman, remember what I said at the beginning of the video. He's not a hack. He's a person. See you next time.